Now, actually, we, we've been talking quite a lot about hydrogen already, but now the real, uh, the hot hydrogen session comes with the main hydrogen lines. Uh, I just give a very brief introduction uh, on the background here. And you know that uh, uh, thanks to Frank and uh, also our colleague Abstran Bike, uh, they've actually been uh, pushing the hydrogen topic, the green molecule topic for a number of years already. And uh, the, the North Africa Europe Hydrogen Manifesto, you can see here, you can take some pieces if you want, uh, has been uh, well uh, co-authored and developed by, by Frank uh, and he presented it in Berlin at our 10th anniversary uh, in 2019. And then, you know, there was such an interest, uh, such an attention in, in the art loan, some of you were there, uh, that, uh, well, Frank actually said, and, we need to do more than just a working group. So let's launch a, a platform, you know, to lift this to the adequate level. And uh, this, um, this is basically, you know, the, uh, the initial um, idea and, you know, Frank's initiative to set up this, uh, this platform. And we had the first uh, meeting, there was a smaller circle with uh, the CEO of Mazda. He's on our advisory board as well at uh, the World Future Energy Summit almost exactly a, a year ago. And that was a launch meeting uh, at uh, uh, MENA um, Middle East Energy in, in March last year. Some of you were there as well. Um, uh, CEO of Aquapower, for example, was also there. And uh, then that was good. And well, I think um, just to conclude in a year, um, the MENA hydrogen lines could uh, really do quite a lot of activities uh, we, we had uh, different studies. Uh, in that study, also for Jusen Group, uh, we did uh, a wonderful cooperation uh, last year during the lockdown in a very productive manner, you know, looking at eight countries in depth on green hydrogen potential, but Friedrich Ebert Foundation, you know, and then, you know, we had a number of meetings in the actions, uh, which uh, were actually quite impressive. You know, the, the first public meeting had 500 participants uh, online. So we're actually very happy, you know, that this new format has been adopted by different people and we could, you know, start a dialogue also with the public sector stakeholders, like, you know, with the ministry here, I mentioned before, some of the other countries we're helping the background, such as Saudi or uh, Morocco or Algeria, which uh, is exactly the right form to, uh, you know, to promote projects, business cases, to obviously work on a number of topics and Frank will uh, talk more about this. So now I think, well, Frank will of course give an update on the hydrogen uh, lines in general, and then we will have uh, Alex um, as well. Um, Alexander Sarge is a partner with Edelshaw Collard and he's been our legal director for quite some time as well. And we've been uh, cooperating in different uh, countries. Uh, uh, Alex is also very experienced in Africa, worked on, on land park uh, transactions uh, there in the energy sector. Um, and then we have our CTO, Fadi Malouf, um, unfortunately only remotely on the levelized cost of hydrogen model toolkit. Uh, and then um, the head of Hydrogen Europe, Jorgo Schatzmakakis, uh, will be there, and, uh, and Bauta, the head of uh, the Certify Initiative. But um, I think over to you, Frank, and thanks a lot for this initiative. I think that brought DI to another level. Thank you, Cornelius. Uh, uh, yes, I'll, I'll be talking about hydrogen because that's sort of like what, what we do. Um, and uh, yes, indeed, we have um, uh, we we have been working on hydrogen uh, as DII for quite for quite some time now. Uh, I, I think uh, if you haven't had the copy of the uh, the manifesto, which we launched in 2019, they're they're on the table to the left. Um, now, the manifesto looked at um, it, it, it basically described a vision. Uh, of 50% clean electricity and 50% hydrogen for Europe. Uh, and then when you do the numbers, you'll soon realize that, you know, you cannot produce all that amount of hydrogen in Europe. So there is that import component. And I think this was uh, already mentioned by many people uh, in the past, but it's also a 2050 vision. Uh, and if I look at myself statistically, uh, I will be dead by 2050. So uh, it was also important to look at what, what do we do? What do we do? What do we need to do now? And that led to uh, the second paper, which we published and supported together with Hydrogen Europe, the two times 40 gigawatts initiative, which was, you know, basically looking at, uh, you know, short term action towards 2030 uh, for Europe, 40, 40 gigawatts of electrolyzers in Europe and 40 gigawatts uh, abroad for import. 
And um, you know that paper actually made it into the European hydrogen strategy. So I think it's a, it's, it's a very strong indication how influential we can be if we work together and, and put our thinking caps on. Um, but again, uh, 20, 2030 is still 10 years away. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at the European hydrogen um, the strategy, it has short-term goals until 2024. We need to have six gigawatts of electrolyzers, one million tons of, of, of green and uh, clean hydrogen. Um, and, and how is that going to happen? Because the reality is there's no market for hydrogen. Uh, the reality is we're making PowerPoints and we're not building stuff yet. So the third paper that we're working on right now, and I'll get back to that a little bit later, is concrete policy support. Because the reality is we're still far away from a competitive cost position. Uh, I mean, we all love the stuff. We know it's going to be competitive, but right now, you know, it, it wouldn't happen on its own. Um, so the private sector needs the public sector and vice versa to make this happen uh, in, in the short term. And we've done, we've put some thinking in that. So um, basically what, what we um, would like um, to take your attention for in the next uh, couple of minutes uh, is think about uh, what are topics that are relevant for you. Uh, and we've, uh, we've, we've made some proposals, but again, these are just uh, proposals. Um, but, but these are some of the things that we think that as a platform, as DII, as the MENA Hydrogen Alliance, uh, we could work on. Um, you know, expand the alliance with select private and public sector research partners, uh, because there is still a lot of research to be done and how to do that. Uh, what are the topics that uh, that should uh, then focus on? Um, I mean, MOUs, DII is a platform. We're working very closely together with Hydrogen Europe, but there is others, uh, Zen in Morocco, uh, GIZ, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, is that something that you see as, uh, as important for us to do? Um, international partnerships to, you know, basically look at concrete projects. Uh, we're seeing a lot of momentum uh, from this region uh, to work on hydrogen and, and hydrogen products um, for, in, you know, domestic market, but also for export. We've, we've heard Neon, but also Abu Dhabi is now uh, looking towards that in Oman, we have uh, the Dukum port and the port of Sohar that are looking to other ports to create a link, etc. How can we support those things? Um, the Oman side is great to, to know that you can make green hydrogen, but who's going to buy it? So what are they going to use it for? Who is going to pay for that? All of those things, that needs a lot of thinking. I think it's easy to make it. And for example, if I look at Abu Dhabi, they know very well where they're going to make the hydrogen. But where to sell it to? Is it going to be Japan? Is it going to be Korea? Is it going to be Europe? Is it going to be other places in North Africa? Who's going to pay for that? Why are they going to pay for that? So those things. Um, maintaining a project tracker, and not just for the production, but for all the other things around it, could be something that we could do. Maintain a database on startups. I mean, there's a lot of activity in, in all kinds of people that uh, make valves and compressors and, and all kinds of things and, and electrolyzers and fuel cells, etc. Perhaps that could be interesting also for the region. Um, working on standards and codes. I mean, this is something that um, it's all over the place. There's not a unified set of standards for safety, for, for product quality, the guarantees of origin, all of those things. I think uh, they're important enablers of trade and then you know, global policies, monitoring that, you know, who does what, how can we, you know, take best practices from uh, from one country uh, to the other, and then translate that into, um, you know, advice to policymakers, as, as I think Cornelius already mentioned, EII and, and Fadi is, for example, very instrumental uh, in working with the Ministry of Energy of the United Arab Emirates, because they want to include hydrogen in the next five year planning. And uh, the, the cost tool that Fadi has developed, uh, you know, is now being used to calculate, you know, what that means for, for the country. Then, I mean, the, the big question, you can make hydrogen, but then how do you get it 
How do you get it to, uh, to the non site? You can use a pipe, you can make it liquid, you can make it in, turn it into ammonia. There's all kinds of things that you can do. There is not a very straightforward answer, you know, what's the best. I, mean, uh, I think in reality, we will probably have all of them, but still, you know, depending on your location, you know, providing, you know, additional insights into that, um, you know, how, how to make, uh, how to arrive at a decision on that. Uh, the certified project, I think we'll, we'll see that later, while well, just want to help present that, so don't need to spend much time on that. Cooperation with the European Commission to organize events. Uh, we know that the European Green Deal has a public diplomacy component, so we like to come and explain what it means. I had the pleasure of, for example, explaining the, the Green Deal uh, to Saudi Arabia last, last year. It was like going to the butcher shop and telling them that you want to become a vegetarian. Um, it's not easy, but uh, it has to be done. Um, calculate, propose some ex exemplary business cases. Um, again, trying to better understand, you know, how these things can work and how you can make uh, a real business out of it. Um, I think electrolysis is the main, is the key technology in, in, in between everything. Um, you know, find a way, you know, how to get on top of the latest developments, probably a lot happening behind the scenes that we don't know. And then, um, um, you know, how to, for example, integrate the, you know, the water production with the production of ammonia, all those aspects uh, that are very relevant for this region, uh, especially I think at what scale water is definitely going to be an issue. It is already an issue, what you do with the brine, etc. and uh, all of those questions. So, um, I mean, these are, these are just thoughts. Um, if, if, if somebody has like an immediate reaction, we're very, very happy to, to take those on board. Um, otherwise, uh, if, if you need a bit more time, I think all of this material will be distributed. Please give us your feedback, you know, tell us uh, what is important for you, because obviously we can't do everything. Uh, and these are just uh, some ideas that, that we think, uh, you know, could be helpful. Uh, for DII. Um, this, can you go one, one back? So uh, let's get back to, you know, the three-step approach, the vision 2050, then the two times 40 gigawatts by 2030, uh, two times 40 gigawatts, and, and then basically what, what, do we de what do we do now? And what we've been working on the last um, almost a year or so um, is on uh, developing a hydrogen act for Europe. So we've given that some thought because if you're looking at, um, you know, what hydrogen is, is sits at the moment, because obviously there's no market for hydrogen. And most of it is, you know, in a refinery and an ammonia plant. It's all captive, so it's not a traded commodity. All of that is going to change, um, but it touches on fuels, industrial, uh, electricity, gas, you know, it's part of the emissions uh, landscape and obviously can be a transport issue. Uh, so people are debating hydrogen in, in, in all those sectors. So it's all over the place and everybody wants to own it. If you look at the, the gas sector, they say, oh, hydrogen is ours, electricity, I don't know, no, no, electricity, we, we make hydrogen with electricity. Fuels, no, 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 it's a fuel. So it's, it's all over the place and it's not very well coordinated. Um, and the idea that we developed was uh, a hydrogen act, which looks at you know, um, infrastructure as well as market mechanisms. And the idea is to have one central place where you come up with some of the frameworks for legislation on those topics, because we need to think about, you know, developing a market and that will, will not be, you know, a linear development because we know that there is going to be a time where you need either, um, you know, some, some financial support in terms of subsidies or you need Quota, and this is something that Alex and I will, will get get into a little bit more detail into later. Um, but but until the time that, that you have the cost competitive situation where it will be uh, a market like we have for other for, for gas or for uh, for anything um, that will take some time. So so until that time, you need a different kind of regulatory regime than after that. So we've we've put some thinking into that. Um, and, you know, we're about to publish that. There will be a co-publication with the Hydrogen Europe again for maximum impact because 
uh, especially the, the European you know, decision makers, they, they listen to Hydrogen Europe. Um, and I think it's again another good example of you know, how the AI actually has an impact. And, and the last slide actually shows that. So from an, from an afterthought and a very dispersed um, uh, debate, you know, we'll go to a central location um, where you have some fundamental principles on how to regulate hydrogen. You know, that then informs, of course, all the other sectors, because in the end, it, it will touch upon, you know, fuels and transport and industry and, and, and gas, etc. But at least it's one place where, you know, that debate takes place. And I think that's important. I think the, the, the next 15, 20 minutes presentation and discussions with you are quite inspired by an article, uh, the article that Frank mentioned, uh, which I think is a pretty smart article on the on an, on an hydrogen act. So if once it's available, I recommend reading it. It's a uh, it's a uh, complex but not boring. So very good, well done. Um, what, what, what we were discussing kind of like as a theme for, for this session was really um, think about um, whether there should be or, or regulatory um, intervention options in the GCC. If we go by to the next slide. Um, and then I think it's probably quite, quite useful to start at the high level. So most of you are in business and for business, decision-making processes are complicated, but the goals are simple. A business is set up to make, to generate profit. And then, so you will have to do that within uh, the regulatory framework in which you operate. So your board will tell you that you cannot do anything illegal, but otherwise it's profit optimization or close to. For governments, the, um, uh, making policy and regulating is often much more complicated. Um, the first uh, decision that the government has to make is, it's a new technology, uh, or not new, but new applications and emerging applications. And the first choice that the government has to, has to take is whether it wishes to regulate hydrogen or hydrogen markets uh, or parts and sectors thereof or not at all and just leave it to the market. And um, uh, that's a good starting point because we're probably in GCC at a point where this, this decision even has to be made at, at, at particular levels. And then the complexity of government decisions should not be underestimated. Um, a government doesn't have the simple choice of just making profit. If there's, there's other motivations, for example, for, to regulate hydrogen and introduce it in, within the regulatory framework, and we just list here a few um, uh, examples. So it could be reduction of emissions and pollution, being part of an energy transition, energy independence, which is highly political, uh, production and supply of hydrogen for domestic and international markets, uh, creation of technology advances, uh, advances. I think in your paper you mentioned, Frank, you know, the European Union uh, should be regulating effectively to become a technology leader. And that is a total different motivation than just energy transition, for example. Um, regional domestic re reasons, and then of course, uh, geostrategic considerations and a whole range of other things. But there is the, quite a high level of complexity for the government, um, but you can kind of narrow it down when you look at the tools, how a government can regulate. They have effectively um, a choice where they want to regulate the demand or the, and or the supply side. And this is super simplified, but it kind of like works actually. Um, and when they regulate, they can choose between um, what I call usually law making negative or positive sanctions. So negative sanctions, you must not do that. Or if you do that, then you have to pay extra. Or positive sanctions, well, we just help you doing something. You get a tax holiday, you get a direct subsidy, or uh, any other preferential treatment. So demand and supply side, and either negative sanctions or positive sanctions. And when you put those four things together, that's really your policy mix. That's what you do, even when you end up with 1200 pages European directive on hydrogen, which hopefully inspired by Frank's paper. Um, now, the biggest challenge is how do you create the perfect mix to achieve your policy goals? And again, the policy goals could be could, could vary from country to, to country and even from policymaker to policymaker within the government. But the mix is critical to achieve. First, you have to define what you want to achieve, and then you know what the toolbox looks like. And then you can start playing around with it to get the best result. Um, and this is, we don't want to get too much into detail, so, but 
um, as we want to in what few <laughs> next five or ten minutes. Um, but we try to to break this down a little bit, very high level supply and demand side. That's effectively here, and then uh, uh, positive, uh, negative, and positive sanctions. So just the um, very obvious supply side uh, negative sanction is um, European directive that says by 2022 there must not be any coal fire power stations anymore. That is pretty rigorous. That kind of works, and that is in your tool mix, like sits right there, or. Um, uh, for on the on the demand side with positive sanctions, um, subsidize uh, market access and user and, and user uh, um, applications or granting tax holidays. So, yeah. Yeah. Can I get this? Sorry, positive. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is negative and this is positive and this is supply and demand. I think there's probably other ways to demonstrate that, but we wanted to keep it really simple. And now, that's, now, now we make it complicated for you um, because we would like to involve you and we will ask all of you and probably point it in, in the microphone. We would like for you to pick a country in the GCC and one regulatory measure that if you would be in charge of that country in relation to hydrogen, that you would pick in order to achieve your policy goal. You don't have to explain the goal, but if you just say, okay, I would do this if I would be in charge for a day. Should we just start with you? <laughs> yeah, that's the, the tough that's one, I guess. That's the, uh, you don't sit in the first row. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess carbon pricing would be a start uh, for the consumers of, um, of products, the consumption of which emits carbon. That would incentivize them to switch. And which country? Uh, across, I mean, you can also take across GCC. Uh, if it were possible across GCC, but Saudi, of course, scale would make the most impact. Maybe Abu Dhabi is slightly easier to decide uh, in terms of policy. I don't know. No, that's a good one. Any, anybody else? And again, there's no wrong answers. We just like everybody's <laughs> ideas. If you don't uh, volunteer, that we would just take <laughs> You want to? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, uh, it's the, I'm in charge of the UAE, uh, or Abu Dhabi in particular. And for me, it, I'd, I'd like to see what they've already started putting in place the coordinated framework on the, the, who's actually driving the strategy. Because uh, certainly a couple of years ago, that wasn't clear. But now, with the, the recent alliance, now that's a lot clearer on what's happening. So, that coordinated approach from the government. Very good, very important. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would say also for UAE and um, what what my policy initiative would be would be to uh, really subsidize or encourage uh, education into uh, the renewable energy engineering fields and make sure that uh, there is a capable pool of people that are being educated that can actually. Uh, grasp uh, the, the new technologies and uh, design the products that are needed for the energy transition. So it's, I like that because that's actually something the AI can also do. Yeah. With it. I would say the same, no, in the UAE, probably the, the government could uh, push the private sector to, to implement these new technologies as they did with the, with the solar uh, by launching new tenders for this technology and encouraging the private companies to to bring that to the to the country. It's going to be possible. Public auctions. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, on an export perspective, I think yeah, that's important for all the GCC country or even the main uh, to to be prepared to have the the, the framework to to have um, coherent things that would bring the, the, the hydrogen to be certified for the export. If you are talking about green hydrogen, what it is for Europe. So if you are producing, but then it's not certified, uh, and the same for the blue. Uh, so the, to, to align the, the regulation to be sure that the hydrogen will be certified for the market you want to address. Very good point. Uh, 
um, I was thinking more along the lines of where you have certain countries which already subsidize certain types of fuels rather than transfer or perhaps transfer their subsidies to hydrogen EV or clean fuels. So for instance, in Saudi, where you've got diesel and other subsidies, ship that over. Very good. Funding, I think, is a critical issue that we always have to think about. Um, in Dubai, there is a Dubai Green Fund, which is basically providing funds, or cheap, affordable funding to green projects, renewable energy, energy efficiency, district cooling. Hydrogen hasn't been considered or discussed. That could be something to be considered there, at least to earmark part of that money to allow the private sector to start spending, spending money into that. And the final thing, probably easing out the restrictions to set up companies without having to have any kind of local partnership to do R&D in hydrogen production here. Very good. Anybody, anything on Kuwait or Oman, Bahrain, Qatar? I would like to go to the last table because the gentleman sitting all the way in the back, they think they don't have to say anything. <laughs> oh, I think on, uh, in the area of uh, industry startups, uh, celebrate early successes, I think is very important. Make sure that that is uh, spread out uh, over all the networks because people pick up on this and this puts people thinking and you would be surprised how many ideas are uh, started from some other spark that comes from somewhere else in the world. So like uh, creating more awareness, more uh, publicity about uh, some of the things that we're doing? Yeah, celebrate the successes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. My, my point would be that more of uh, involvement of the government uh, into all these projects, like how uh, government gets involved with solar tenders and pushing the cost lower. So people fight competition, as I said, like there, is, there should be some competition so people get more attracted to, to uh, involving themselves in hydrogen. Thank you. That is indeed, I mean, one, one of the things that this region is really good at is public procurement. I mean, the reason why we have the lowest cost solar energy is because they, they organize it very well. And yeah, why not do that for hydrogen? Yeah. What I think as well, and um, especially Abu Dhabi, but I guess also Dubai, would be that um, there needs to be some thinking about privatizing or at least uh, allowing private companies into the electricity sphere, but also in the in, in the, the, the petrol cell sphere, so to say, because what you see is at the moment, it's all government run companies that are uh, that, that own all the power generating assets, that own all the petrol stations. So there is no private market there, or there's no private uh, industry there that can be competitive uh, and develop new ideas. Very good. Here's one. Um, so this is in general for all the uh, Gulf countries, uh, the economic development uh, is very much driven by uh, ambitious uh, visions, targets. So when it comes to uh, green hydrogen, um, the I, I can be involved in, uh, in getting in touch with the, with the governments and show them the potential behind this and, and come up with powerful uh, visions and, and, and measurable uh, targets and, and also support uh, and, and show how a pathway could go. And uh, I think uh, when it comes here, uh, it's very uh, target driven. Yeah, indeed. I mean, uh, yeah, how, how to turn a target into, you know, roadmap and then into policies and all of those things. At least it's in there. Yeah, yeah. It's in, it's document. Even if there are no concrete actions for the moment, but it's there. And then people can start, okay, how do we get there? But because it's, it's uh, defined by the government, it has automatically meaning and something must come. Good point. Yeah. And it's also interesting because that is a different approach than, for example, the EU, which is a very highly regulated environment where usually policymakers define goals, policy goals, and then they do it down, and then they create make huge lines of legislation. Whereas here in the region it's often, I mean, the steps are much faster. Yes. And and I think the regulated community is, is simpler, it's smaller. So I think there's the right um, defining ambitious targets works here much better than in the EU or in the US. That's a very good point.
Excellent. Well, thank you for participating in our live session.